No, there shouldn't be a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients. And no, I don't care if that's insensitive. Having borders is normal. DACA is abnormal. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so I've been very hesitant to make this video because it is really not an interesting topic to me until I stumbled upon a huge contingent of people who are genuinely insane because that's the only way I can describe those who take up the position which essentially amounts to militancy for the United States to basically abolish itself. Because abolishing the border is abolishing a country, that border exists for, and there's no way to work around that. Later on, I also remember that I did make in the past a video about the voter ID, emphasizing that everywhere else on the planet, the right and the left fundamentally agree that something, some, showing some form of identification is absolutely necessary before you cast a ballot uh, in an election. Well, except for the American left, which seems to be entirely convinced that voter ID is racist because Negroes and Latinos are so bloody stupid that they can't get an ID card. That's what American leftists believe. And they call me a racist because potato. Now, for the purposes of clarity and order, this video will be structured as follows. 1. What is DACA? 2. The current status. 3. Controversies about it. 4. Acceptable and unacceptable trade-offs, bearing in mind that solutions don't exist. 5. Other countries. and 6. Comments and conclusions. So, let's start with the facts, both for those who hear about this for the first time and for those familiar with it in part. So, the topic at hand is DACA. DACA is an acronym for the policy called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, an immigration policy created by the Obama administration via executive order. Like any executive order, it can easily be dismantled by another executive order, which is why it is always recommended that you legislate via the legislative branch, the Congress in the case of the United States, and not by executive order. This is true in all countries except North Korea and a few autocracies like Singapore and Saudi Arabia. Even in Iran, the Ayatollah has to convince the parliament because otherwise his policies can be overridden by others or by the next Ayatollah. Now, this policy allowed for some individuals who entered the United States as minors and subsequently remained in the country illegally to get a renewable two-year grace period, essentially of deferred action from deportation, hence the name of the program. The policy also allowed these individuals to be eligible for a work permit. About 800,000-ish individuals were enrolled in the program at the moment when it was rescinded. More on that later. Now, in the media, you might have also uh, heard a term called the dreamers, which is essentially a propagandistic term deployed by the leftist media complex to further obfuscate the issue. The term dreamer is derived from a failed piece of legislation called the Development, Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act, or the DREAM Act. That piece of legislation was first introduced 17 years ago, in 2001, during the Bush administration, about a month before 9-11. The bill failed and was reintroduced several times since then, and failed every single time. Nevertheless, the Democrat media complex have been using this term derived from this failed piece of legislation multiple times in order to push the agenda that there's somehow something bad if the American taxpayer isn't compelled at gunpoint to provide a pathway to citizenship to people who are, for all intents and purposes, criminals by virtue of being illegal aliens. Now, one of the reasons this is not an even, even bigger issue is because in 2014 and 2015, multiple US states sued the Obama administration and won, thus preventing Hussein Obama's attempt to expand the DACA policy even further. And that's how we get to the current status. 
So election happens, Donald Trump gets in, and soon after the Homeland Security stops any expansion and begins a long process of reviewing the DACA program as a whole. Soon after, the Trump administration rescinds the policy entirely and gives the Congress six months to decide how to deal with this. Now, you can say what you want about Donald Trump, but this is by far the most moral position to take. Donald Trump is, just like Barack Obama was, the head of the government, that is to say, the executive branch. His role is to execute the law. And since there is no law in this case, he did what is expected. He passed the issue to the legislative branch asking for a law on the issue. And this is where we are now. The six months of grace period expires by my calculations roughly this week or maybe next week, depending on when I publish this video. I should probably say that at the moment of this recording, the Trump administration announced no extension of the term. So I am working under the assumption uh, that it's six months counting from September the 5th, 2017. If that changes, doesn't matter, the rest of the arguments still stand. Anyway, so at this point, the, con the Congress is supposed to deliver something to the President. Considered options in the Congress are at the moment of this recording the DREAM Act, which I spoke about earlier, the Recognizing America's Children Act, which offers a pathway to legalization through education, military service or work authorization, and after 10 years in this program, immigrants could apply for citizenship. Then there's the American Hope Act, which does mostly the same, but offers citizenship after 8 years and only to those who got in before they were 18 years of age. And finally, there is the Bridge Act, which is basically an extension of DACA for another 3 years to give more time to discuss the issue. So these are the facts. Those who don't recognize these facts should not be heard on the issue. And I sincerely mean that. There can be no discussion about DACA without first acknowledging, at the very least, these facts. Okay, so now let's get to controversies. Now obviously, if I am to list all of the controversies, it would be a two hour long video and even more than that, and that's quite far from my intention. So I'll only, so I will of course select only a few of them. The biggest con controversy is, of course, the moralistic one, namely, how can you be so cruel as to be in favor of deporting 800,000 people? This controversy is also the easiest to put to rest. The Obama administration deported almost 1 million people just in 2009 alone, and somehow the world didn't collapse. So the idea that it is hard or somehow impossible or even immoral and unheard of to deport 800,000 DACA recipients by 2020 is simply not true. It can be done and it has been done in the recent past, including by the most pro-immigrants president in recent history. Another controversy also related to the first one is the fact that these people were allegedly brought in as minors and thus had no choice in the matter. And this one is slightly more legitimate. Yes, there are cases of individuals who are brought in by their parents as infants or anyway very small children and thus have no sense of home other than the United States. But while that makes for a handful of good sob stories, it still doesn't change the fact that they are illegal aliens and therefore, for all intents and purposes, criminals. And the United States is the only country that did not ratify the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. This means that the United States retains its right to treat juvenile offenders like adults. Because remember, the Supreme Court only decided that executions and life imprisonment for juvenile offenders constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. It doesn't say anything about deportations or even imprisonment now followed by deportations. <clears throat> Another controversy is a fiscal and economic one. Pro-open borders shills insist that executing the law as it stands right now, i.e. immediate deportation unless the Congress does something, would be very costly for the United States. For instance, the Center for American Progress, a virulent far leftist think tank founded by John Podesta, yeah, that John Podesta with the weird child porn art and dark blood theme posts, that lovely guy. So anyway, his institute estimated that in 2017, uh, the loss of all DACA eligible workers would reduce US GDP by $433 billion over the next 10 years. Now, that sounds terrible. 
Let's assume that is correct for the sake of the argument. 433 billion over 10 years, that means 43-ish billion dollars per year, right? Or the GDP of the United States in 2016 was 18.62 trillion dollars, or in other words, 18,624 billion dollars. In other words, uh, four, 43 uh, billion dollars would be about 0.23% of the 2016 GDP, considering that the GDP in 2017 was and in 2018 will be even bigger because of the economic growth, the percentage will be even lower than that. So even if we take Podesta's word for it, which nobody mentally sane should do, this is still a very legitimate argument to be made that such cost is totally worth it. Another economic argument being made is that the American taxpayer already paid for these DACA recipients' education and whatnot, and it would thus be a waste uh, of resources to deport them now just as they start joining the productive class. So goes the argument. Well, aside from the fact that most of them don't, let's assume that this is indeed the case. Again, for the sake of the argument. Wouldn't it be nice, though, for the countries of origin of these illegal immigrants to suddenly get an unexpected help by getting back some of their citizens who come with first world education? I mean, if you care about uh, that much about helping third world countries, then the best you can do is send them smart people to help make those countries great again. So if anything, deporting DACA recipients can reasonably be argued to be a form of highly useful foreign aid. Countries usually pay lots of money to, uh, voluntarily to convince smarter and better educated people to move in and live on their territories. The countries of origin of these uh, illegal immigrants would get them for free, all on the dime of the Uncle Sam. Where's your compassion for the well-being of Latin America, lefties? All right. Now let's talk about uh, a little bit about acceptable and unacceptable trade-offs. Again, bearing in mind that solutions don't exist. Of course, at a human level, it is not hard to empathize with the argument that at least some of the cases, individuals would end up being punished for the crimes of their parents. But this is exactly why empathy and feelings should not dictate policy. Besides, the United States draws some of its legal tradition from the Roman Empire, just like most of Europe. You know what they used to say in uh, the Roman Empire? Dura lex sed lex. The law is harsh, but it is the law. And the United States claims to be a nation of laws and not a nation of men. The American left, however, wants it to be a nation of men, apparently, since they support the perpetuation of the state of basically lawlessness in which these individuals find themselves in right now. So anyone opining on this issue must ask this question. Should the United States remain a nation of laws or become a nation of men? You can't have them both. If it's a nation of laws, then these individuals need to go back, as a principle. Now, how can that principle be applied is indeed a separate story. Now look, I am not, nor do I claim to be, an expert in American immigration law. But as a long-time traveler into more countries in a decade than American leftists will see in five lives, I know that there are some things that are constant in essentially all countries except dictatorships like North Korea or Uzbekistan. Not all dictatorships are like that, by the way. For instance, recently the media published a very nice sob story about a gardener who has been living illegally in the United States for 29 years and was finally deported. The media insisted that he's married with two children and oh my god, how terrible the Trump administration is for tearing his family apart. There's just one problem. Nobody stopped him in the previous 20 years since he turned 18 to leave the country and then come back legally. Or at least after he married, he could have just taken a trip to Mexico for a couple of days and then applied to get back as a husband of an American citizen. People do this all the time in other countries. And this example is usually quite common. Individuals who could have, and many of them still can do this, you know, get out for a few days and then come back legally and then just follow the procedure. Oh, but it's hard, you see. It's so hard, the procedure is too complicated. 
cries the left. Or they tell you that DACA recipients have no path to citizenship, which is true. Which is why I'm saying they need to get out for a while and then come back legally. Yes, it's bloody hard, but so what? There is no such thing as an unalienable right to live in the United States. Now, of course, some cases are horrific, but by and large, we're talking about adults here. According to DACA rules, you had to be under the age of 31 on June the 15th, 2012, or born on June the 16th, 1981, or after, to qualify for the DACA program. So the oldest member is uh, now, what, 37? Hardly young people who are victims, don't you think? I mean, don't get me wrong, it really sucks, but the level of empathy must be significantly lowered since we're talking about people who've had years to do something about their status, but chose not to do anything. So an acceptable trade-off would be to give a pathway to citizenship to those who are, let's say, younger than 12 today, meaning born in January 2006 or later. The cutoff point is not chosen randomly, by the way. The age of 12 appears to be the de facto age of criminal responsibility in the United States. Now, if you think that's messed up, it's too low and whatnot, please be reminded the United Kingdom has the minimum age of criminal responsibility set at 10. Just saying. So, in the case of individuals who are 12 or younger, there is a reasonable and acceptable case to be made that these individuals are not responsible for the crime of having immigrated illegally into the United States. Everyone else, though, yeah, kinda is responsible. And yes, I know it's harsh, but then again, I didn't write the laws, and as I'll explain in the next segment, it's actually a pretty common practice globally. I thought leftists like standard global practices. In any event, it is patently absurd to give a pathway to citizenship to people who ha have, who've had 10 years or more to fix their legal status, but consciously chose not to because it was too hard. Well, guess what? Life is hard. Ultimately, the least acceptable trade-off is to give amnesty or to provide in bulk paths to citizenship to all DACA recipients. In fact, this dichotomy between illegal immigrant on one hand and citizen on the other hand, this dichotomy needs to be broken as well. There are more things in between, you know? Why do they need citizenship, by the way? People have been living on residence permits, well, since forever, since the notion of a residence permit was invented. A relative uh, um, of a friend of mine has been living in the United States on renewable green cards since the 1980s. The chaps at the Immigration and Custom Enforcement are bewildered that he doesn't apply for citizenship. Yet for some reason, this, these criminals somehow deserve citizenship? Why? A somewhat acceptable trade-off could indeed be to give some of these DACA recipients um, green cards while at the same time instituting a permanent ban on them ever receiving citizenship. Why not? It would solve the looming deportation problem while at the same time keep a closer look on the security risk that they present. Because once again, these people have broken the law, continuously, some of them for decades in a row. The idea that any of them are worthy of citizenship is, quite frankly, absurd. You try sneaking into another country, break their laws, and then apply for citizenship. Seriously, you try that. See how that works out. So with that, let's look a little bit to other countries. Let's look at Canada. Settlement.org, a nice website that comes with a Welcome to Ontario banner, and it says like this, quote, To apply for citizenship, you must meet certain eligibility criteria and complete an application. In order to apply for Canadian citizenship, you must be over 18, provide proof that you know how to speak and write in one of Canada's official language, either English or French, be a permanent resident, have lived in Canada as a permanent resident for at least three hour, years out of the five years before you apply, have filed your taxes for at least three years during the last five years, and any income tax you may owe must be paid. IRCC will return your application as incomplete if you do not send acceptable proof that you have adequate knowledge of English or French. You cannot become a Canadian citizen if you have recently been or are in prison, on parole or probation, are serving a conditional sentence or have been charged or convicted of an incredible, in indictable crime. If you are under a deportation order, you also cannot apply." Close quote. This is already more complex than the United States, which doesn't even require minimum knowledge in English. How do you get a, a permanent residence? 
Well, that's not complicated unless you're from India. You just provide a copy of your passport, pay a fee, fill in a form, and that's pretty much it. That is, if you come to Canada from a country which has a visa-free travel agreement with Canada. If you are from India, here's what you need to get permanent residence in Canada. Sufficient funds proof to support the application, educational credential assessment, skills assessment test, language test results, additional fees, and other documenting depending on your type of visa. That's already significantly harder than the United States. And I thought leftists want to be more like Canada. But let me tell you something. Canada is easy. Most countries in the world require a lot more than Canada. So I picked some random examples. I looked up France, Saudi Arabia, Romania, Senegal, and India. All five of them uh, have stricter rules than either the United States or Canada. For instance, you cannot be a citizen in France, Saudi Arabia, or Romania without speaking the national language. This is not negotiable. In Senegal, the government can oppose your citizenship by decree even after you obtain it legally. Basically, if you get a Senegalese passport, the government has one year to change its mind. Also, in Senegal, you cannot acquire citizenship through a marriage unless you're a woman. Yes, really, if you're a man, you need to work for your citizenship. This is all in Article 7 from Law No. 89-42 of December the 26th, 1989. Saudi Arabia also has similarly weird naturalization laws. Basically, it's easier to get Saudi uh, citizenship as a woman than it is as a man. And getting Saudi Arabian nationality comes with a prerequisite of being moral in the Wahhabi Islam sense. But all of these five examples have things in common. They require applicants to not have a criminal record. They require applicants to be 18 years of age or older. They require applicants to speak the official language of the country or one of them. They require the applicant not be a burden on the society and insist on providing proof that the applicant can sustain himself financially and all five have exceptions for individuals deemed to be of extraordinary value for the country. But then there's more quirks. For instance, the Senegalese naturalization law has an article called Article 21b and it has the following uh, provision, quote, a Senegalese who behaves like a national of a foreign country and has the nationality of that country may be declared to have lost Senegalese nationality, close quote. Now, isn't that neat? A <laughs> point I'm trying to make here with these examples is that no matter how harsh you may think the US immigration system is, the overwhelming majority of the world is much harsher most of the time, and at least when it comes to citizenship. Also, American leftists tend to sneer at the conservative suggestion that the United States should get to pick and choose who comes to their country. But again, this is the absolute global standard. Every single country on the planet has different rules depending on the country of origin of the immigrant or even the tourist. For instance, it is much easier for me to immigrate into Ukraine than it is for a Canadian. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it for a minute. There are a lot of Romanian-Ukrainian families, sizable minorities in both countries, and a strong cultural similarity and, dare I say, affinity. Similarly, it is much easier for me to immigrate into Serbia than it is for an American. Actually, scratch that. An American is de facto forbidden from getting citizenship in Serbia. And believe it or not, there are many Americans living in Serbia. They don't scream they're being oppressed for not having citizenship. What they do instead is obey the Serbian laws while they're legally there. So, to sum up, the American immigration system is one of the, if not the most, permissive systems in the world. It has fewer rules than most of the world, but yes, it does expect you to strictly abide by them, and that's not a bad thing. The American left likes to portray itself as an internationalist force that is highly open-minded and reasonable, but nothing could be further from the truth. By international standards, immigration into America is already far more progressive than everyone else, by quite a long margin, mind you. But those advocating for open borders inside the US are not by accident, in my view, the kind of people who've traveled a few times, you know, maybe they traveled to Canada and Mexico, perhaps Haiti, but only in a luxury resort, uh, and suddenly have the impression that they know and understand the world. 
and I'm very serious about this. You won't see well-traveled people, like me for instance, being very keen on open borders. Because once you've seen more than 10 countries, you suddenly start to realize why borders matter. Once you see more than 20 countries, borders become self-evidently necessary. And I speak from experience here. I became far more of a conservative after I started traveling a lot more. So those who are keen on open borders should also try to travel more. I've noticed that American leftists like to slander conservatives as rural dwellers who've never had a passport. Even if that were true, it still doesn't change the fact that a nation exists only as long as it has borders and rules about who goes in, who gets to stay, and who gets citizenship. But that's not really the case. Most intellectual conservatives actually are very well-traveled people, whereas most intellectuals of the modern left really aren't. I mean, Christopher Hitchens, for instance, was a very well-traveled man, but he became much more conservative later in life precisely because he was a well-traveled man. But think of the intellectual leaders of the modern left. How many of them have seen more than 10 countries? How many of them can claim to know from the ground at least 5 countries? The answer is not that many. And that is the problem. The debate about immigration from the left in the United States is led by people who don't know much about the subject matter and instead rely on emotions to drive their policy beliefs. And that, my fellow deplorables, is terrible. It is not a surprise that Donald Trump, even though he has Democrat instincts on this topic, still holds a far more nuanced position about the topic precisely because he had to deal with the system in other countries by virtue of his expanding business. In other words, he knows more than Chuck Schumer will ever know. Ultimately, I don't know what will be the policy adopted on this issue, and as I said at the beginning, it's not an issue of particular interest to me. I do know what my preference is, but ultimately my preference is irrelevant, as I'm not an American citizen, nor will I ever be one. What I do know, though, is that the debate will continue to go in circles as long as most actors involved don't want to look at the facts, and will continue to go in circles as long as the cathedral media is focused entirely on comments that the President of the United States may or may not have made instead of the policy matters. This is what I tried in this video, to outline policy matters and a few facts. I'm sure by the time I'll edit this video, I'll realize I missed some extra things. But if there's anyone from the left watching this, Please, disregard my con comments and my opinions, and at the very least, look at the facts. You can't have a nation without borders. No, not all immigrants are created equal, and no, nobody is above the law, not even illegal immigrants who are children at some point in time. And no, the US immigration system is not fantastic, nor oppressive, and nor, it is not fascistic either, nor particularly complicated. In order to deem something oppressive, you need to compare it with something. You know, compare to what question? And in comparison to most of the world, the United States of America is still quite open to immigrants. Whether you believe it is too open or you believe it is not open enough, these facts need to be acknowledged before a discussion can even happen. And with all of that being said, thank you for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, please do subscribe to my social media, and um, I'll see you all soon on Freedom Alternative.